you brought up the addiction. I didn't know if that was related to you leaving the band or not, no. but apparently not. No. Um, what, uh, what was kind of the reason for the uh, getting sober and what was the end of the addiction? Well, or the end of okay. the, the use? I grew up feeling really insecure, feeling small. I was skinny. Um, I was kind of always in trouble. I felt like an outcast. I felt like I didn't belong. And drugs is a good way to fucking numb that stuff, right? And with insecurity, you just want to be accepted. So I hung out with the bottom of the barrel. You know, no disrespect to anybody, but I hung out with people that 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 were the same as me. Sure. You know, and it, and it, for a long time, it saved my life because it gave me that acceptance. Um, but as the more you keep putting a Band-Aid on top of a Band-Aid, the drugs on top of the drugs, the wound inside is still isn't healing, right? So I started doing heroin in 85, I guess, somewhere around the 85 or 86. And I was, you know, drinking a lot and just, and I turned into one of these street kids panhandling for money. I really did because the band wasn't a band until Mike was out of school, right? So I'd have nine months a year to fuck off. Um, in 1992, we were getting to ready to record White Trash, Two Heaps, and a Bean, and I was super strung out, and my, the guys in the band, in the past, I said, we need to kick Smelly out, he's holding us back, you know, he's, he's on drugs, it's a, it's a mess, and Mike was always like, no, dude, he's not holding us back, you guys smoke weed every day, I drink, it's just his drug of choice, until it gets in the way of the band, we have no say, you know, like it's his time, you know, cause I would still show up to practice. I'd still show up to shows yeah. and I'd still do my job. But then in, in the, in the early nineties, it started slipping, you know, six, seven, eight years, seven years into the heroin. Um, so one day we're getting ready to record white trash and Mike pulled me aside and they had always threatened to kick me out before I would hear rumblings, you know, but Mike was like, dude, we're going to kick you out. You're going to be gone unless you go to rehab. And at that stage, it really resonated with me because I had lost my family, like my mom and dad. I couldn't go to the houses for Christmas. I couldn't, you know, I was... They, they barred you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the tough love thing. But I didn't have any friends, really, other than junkies. I was homeless. Uh, the band was my last piece of tangible reality. The only thing that really meant something to me that I still had. So if I lost the band, I would have nothing. Literally nothing, you know? I would be just that kid alone on the street corner by himself. And that and the band like meant that much to me. Um, and it wasn't, we weren't making money. It was just playing, the traveling. The, it was the last piece of solid reality that I had. And I knew at that moment, if I, lost the, if I lost the band, I would have lost everything and I would end up probably dying very shortly there afterwards alone. Mm. So it, it was my bottom. It was my bottom. And, and so I uh, went to rehab for two months. And the day I walked into the rehab, it was a real low budget. A lot of people getting out of prison. A lot of like just, it was a heavy place. It wasn't like a fucking Betty Ford place or whatever. I said, I'm going to give this my all. It was 60 days. I'm going to give this my all every single fucking second of every day. Because I had never completed anything that I'd ever done in the past. Like, you know, I'd start something and I'd quit or I'd do this. Or, you know, it's just it's part of the insecurity. You know, might as well give up on something before you fail. Because mm. at least it's on your terms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I was like, if I if I give it the all every single fucking second of the day, every day, if I get high the second I walked out, at least I really tried. I haven't gotten high since. I walked out 60 days later and here I am today, 31 years. That's insane. No relapse oh, ever. Nothing. I mean, I'd been on methadone for a long time. I'd wanted to quit, but no. What um, do you work the program mm -hmm. ever since then, or what's been successful in that amount? Program of time? for the like AA and NA for the first like couple decades, a lot, you know, but more of the principles that I learned, you know, like being responsible for your reactions. Uh, treating people with kindness and treating yourself with kindness, you know, apologize without the word, but even if like you wronged, let's say you fucking stole my car. And then let's say I fucking slandered you and punched you in the face and all this kind of shit. I got to own that. You know, I guess 
I did this, but you, it's like, no, you, it, and I did a lot of self-reflection and a lot of like forgiveness of my father, you know, because he was just trying his fucking best, mm. you know? And here's another weird story. Um, I got arrested and I was in jail six months before I got sober, right? I called up my parents and I said, hey man, I'm in jail. Can you bail me out? And they're like, no, no. My dad at that point said, what the fuck kind of example am I? I'm a fucking raging alcoholic. He hasn't drank since then. So I have 31 years and so does my dad. He hasn't drank since he didn't bail you out of jail or since you got sober? Since he didn't bail me out of jail, which was six months before I got sober. Gotcha. So he has 31 years so, and six months l longer than me. So did he go to rehab? No, he's... He, he no. just cold turkey He it? cold turkey it. Did he go to AA? No. No, I mean, which was not a good move because you drink and you abuse shit because you got something inside. It Drugs and alcohol aren't the problem. Right. You are. Yeah. It's it's your emotions. It's your baggage. It's, it's your insecurities. So there's this thing called a dry drunk. Somebody that doesn't have the alcohol, but they're still a raging fucking asshole. He was that for a long time. Got it. But he separated himself, but he's been sober for 31 years. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I do want to unpack the the addiction uh, for listeners a little bit, just as kind of a last, like um, give, offer them some takeaways. Because I think a lot of people, they're not struggling with heroin, right? But they are, um, and they might be functioning with whatever it is that they're, a substance that they're using in their life to kind of medicate whatever. Mm -hmm they're still functioning in their everyday life. But so maybe you could uh, offer some advice for what's yeah. on the other, what's on the other side of it. Yeah. Like what are the benefits of abstaining from those substances? Well, first off, like I said, the drugs aren't the problem you are. And you could be, weed could be a problem, fucking food, sex, whatever it is. If you're, masking your real internal feelings and and the more you do it the this is how can i articulate this your body is a bottle you keep stuffing feelings you keep stuffing feelings and the cork is is your substance of stuffing at some point the, the, that bottle is going to overflow and you're going to erupt and you will have like a moment of like this is not the person who i am this is not the person who i want to be and it doesn't matter if you're a functioning alcoholic. It doesn't matter if you're a functioning weed smoker or if you're the guy that's breaking into fucking you know shoe stores to grab a shoe, shoes to sell for sixty bucks. If you feel, if you have insecurity, you have trauma and all that stuff. If you feel that the drugs and alcohol are an issue, then they probably fucking are. Mm. You know, and and it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Life's a lot more open and carefree once you get through the initial turbulence, you know? Well, what happened for you in the band once you got out of rehab and were doing it sober? It was really weird. It was really weird um, because music is a party environment and now I'm like really trying to change my life. So it was this push and pull. I never wanted real, I mean, yes, I've had urges to use and to drink. Uh, it was a lot of self-reflection a lot of like okay i'm in a situation where everybody's partying and i'm here and i'm uncomfortable a lot of like just detaching myself like leaving a situation you know um it's there was a situation where where i was in my bunk in the bus you know we were starting to do pretty well we, and my bunk was right by the front lounge and i could hear the five or six or eight guys whatever in the front talking about me while they're all drinking and they're all like we're so proud of him we're so happy for him he's such a great guy but at the same time i'm hiding from my best friends for my fucking life for my sanity for my what i'm trying to rebuild so it's it's so layered the pushes and the pulls and all this on the road you know yeah um but then again like i got through it i i i did whatever okay where a lot of people fuck up is when, when when they're trying to get like their life in control again from the weed or from the drugs or from this or from that. The key thing is to turn your fucking mouth off, open your brain, and you got two ears. You got two ears and one mouth. Listen. If somebody goes who has more time than you and says, hey, man, I really think that you should do this, 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 this. Fucking do it without question. Because on your own, you're going to fuck it up. Right? And then when you start questioning them, like, why do I got to do that? It's, you're, you're taking it back, mm -hmm. you know? So. 
did the music get better? Did it get? Yeah, more, my playing got get a lot more? better. Okay. Yeah, my because my playing like you can listen. Okay, white trash, two heaps and a bean. I recorded strung out. I went to rehab the day after I fucking got it. You know, it's it's okay. The, our next record was Punk and Drublick. Like the the solidity of the drum tracks is crazy difference, you know? And it wasn't like I'd focused on being a better drummer. I didn't. It's just that I was more present. I was there. I was physically stronger. I could play better, you know? Was it more, was the, was it more rewarding? I didn't really notice it until, uh, until years down the line when I would have to go back and listen to stuff to relearn it for tours. I'd be like, Wow. Then it was noticeable and it was rewarding. At the time, I was just there. You know, I was just present. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah.